Hey. Hey. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? <laughs> I'm well, thank you. Thank you so much for doing this. Yeah, absolutely. Let me tell you why I reached out to you out of the blue, because uh, I'm yeah. sure I'm just sure it's kind of weird. Um, but I'm a geography professor at my regional university at Shippensburg University. And, uh, you know, the whole COVID thing has forced us to go online. And uh, I'm looking for uh, better ways to help my students connect to people in places that they didn't grow up in. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a geographer, so I, I travel, yeah. I, I go and experience different places, I talk with different people. Uh, but getting an 18 or 19 year old to kind of get themselves out of their own zip code headspace and and thinking about the world outside them and how it's different or how it's the same uh, is is a tough thing to do. And um, when I read your article for the Daily Yonder, um, it it suggested that you had thought about your relationship with your hometown and with places far away. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> My whole life, yes. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so uh, I, I wanted to have a chance to, to talk with you um, so that I can have you being the genuine voice of Appalachia and not being the professor who talks about Appalachia, if that makes sense. Yeah, I love that you're doing that. That's very cool. Thanks. Summer. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, All right. So um, I had no idea who you were when I <laughs> found your article. Um, Same. <laughs> I learned that you are a singer, a songwriter, an oh. actor. <laughs> you Googled and, me. <laughs> and I think an avid video gamer. I wrote for a time. Uh, yeah, I wrote for a while for a video game review. Uh, I was a freelance writer for a while. I work for an environmental uh, organization now, but um, used to do a lot of freelance writing. And so that's where that video game okay. thing came up. <laughs> Still out there in the world. <laughs> yeah. Um, you're a college graduate from Davidson, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Very good. Um, but the reason I found you is because of that article you wrote in the Daily Yonder. Um, it was an opinion piece about Ron Howard's film, Hillbilly Elegy. And if I read it correctly, uh, you don't think he got it right? <laughs> <laughs> yep, that's the uh, thesis, yeah. And, and nor do you think that J.D. Vance, who wrote the book on which the film is based, uh, uh, really captured the identity of Appalachia. So I'm curious, what did they get wrong? Well, I think the main thing, um, and I think the main issue that I had with the book and what seemed like um, was being replicated in the movie. At the time that I wrote the article, just the trailer had been released. So I was going off of that, but also basing a lot of my assertions off of reading the book. And the main issue that I think I had with it was that, you know, Vance has a really compelling story about his upbringing and his family and his family's history, but that he was using that story as a way to tell a larger story about an entire region. And I think using one story to make large assertions about an entire group of people, an entire place, um, doesn't paint an appropriate photo, uh, an ap appropriate picture. And so I think in my article, I wanted to make it clear that I had a different story as someone who also came from an impoverished region and came from Appalachia. And my story did not involve, you know, I, my story was that I left and had a really negative experience at times with my with living in that area and grew up thinking that I didn't want to be there and that I think a similar mentality to what Vance was talking about that, you know, to, to really his victory was leaving and that was what was the goal. And for a long time, that was true for me too. But then leaving actually was part of me coming back and learning to love where I was from, where I, and I'm currently living in my hometown in East Tennessee and very happy here and happy that I made that decision. And so I think I wanted to, you know, I also am not a uh, anthropologist, which I point out Vance is not. And so I'm not trying to draw larger assertions, but just to, to show that there are other stories and that his one story doesn't encapsulate an entire region. Okay. Uh, I'd like to unpack some of the things you just told me about yourself. Yeah. Um, 
if I read your article, you struggled with your own identity as an Appalachian. And, mm -hmm. and, and you wrote things like you once had disdain for Appalachia and you struggled to drop your accent. You dreamed up moving to LA in New York, which a lot of people do anyway. <laughs> yeah. um, but you weren't content to stick around the Blue Hills, the trailer parks, the log cabins, or the horse pastures. Um, mm -hmm. what, what, was, what was behind all that? What, was, what were the push factors that were compelling you to leave? Yeah, it definitely didn't come from my family. Um, so my dad is actually the editor of the Daily Yonder, which was the <laughs> where you found that article. Um, and I've I've kind of been always wanting to write a piece for them, but um, you know I have a lot of opinions about a hillbillyology. So finally, that was the piece that you know I started talking, having these conversations with my dad, and he said you should write a piece for the, the Yonder. So he works for this nonprofit. Um, Rural Strategies and is the editor of the Daily Yonder. And so I, he, you know, and my, both of my parents are from that region and grew up there and have lived there their whole lives. So I, they love this area. And um, so it definitely didn't come from them. And so to a certain extent, I think I'm not exactly sure where that sort of shame came from. Um, but I think a lot of it had to do with, um, outside forces and I think seeing the way that Appalachia is portrayed um, and having people, how people react to a certain accent, I think a lot of that was part of it. And also there is a lot of, um, there are a lot of issues here that I, uh, that were hard for me growing up as a kind of outspoken and um, politically active young person. And it's, you know, I grew up in a red state and, um, there are a lot of social issues that were hard to contend with being here. So I think that was part of it, but I think a lot of it was came from sort of, um, you know, wanting to, not wanting to portray myself. I, I remember specifically, um, you know, like you said, I grew up acting and so I was really focused on my voice and I didn't want to come across as like a hick, you know, that as someone would say uh, on stage. And so I would change the way I said get to get and I would focus really hard on those things um, and I don't think consciously I knew that I was doing it because I was I thought that that accent was associated with um, with being from uh, an impoverished region and also being stupid because I think that there's like this really interesting um, and incorrect uh, intersection that we associate with all of these words like rural and poor and Appalachian um, and conservative and that they all kind of swim in the same soup. And that's not always true, but I think in my head as a kid, I was connecting all of those dots and just wanting to, to leave it behind and not be part of any of that because it was all associated with each other. So I think I, and where that came from, I think is a lot of, a, a lot of different places. You're right. The, the, the Appalachian region is painted with a very broad brush. Yeah. And, um, you know, it, it's, it's all white. It's all yep. Scots Irish, which yep. may, or may not be the case for you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, is all conservative, uh, and is yep. all poor. Uh, yes. and, and, I, you know, I drive around through the region and I can find examples of great disparity in wealth. You can find very wealthy places and people and obviously the, the other end. Mm -hmm. um, I saw just as many Biden signs as I did Trump signs. Totally. I, right. But you would not know that if you just listen to the, the, the stereotypical narrative. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's one of the reasons why I'm, I'm trying to reach out to people to kind of illuminate that there are, that the, the students in my classroom have a lot of connections or can have a, a, a lot of shared connections with people who live in other regions that they mm -hmm. might not exist. Um, and that you just can't paint faraway places with a simple broad brush and have that be, um, that, that can't be your operational truth. If right. That makes sense. So. Yeah. And I think that was part of my issue with hillbillyology was that there were these, he uses a lot of anecdotal evidence. And I think there are a lot of stories that he cites, like, you know, I had a coworker who just 
was lazy and didn't want to come to work. And so, and then that becomes a story of an entire region. And it's like that broad brush that you're talking about. And it's like, that's not, that's not a very scientific analysis. It's really, <laughs> you start with a hypothesis and find stories to back it up. And I think that just enhances that narrative that already exists. It, that, that particular narrative always strikes me as odd it, because mm -hmm. um, I know Appalachians as being independent and self-sufficient, uh, which, which in, 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 is its own big broad brush. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, folks who are able to live off the land, who are able to, to do without all of the services and luxuries that you can find, for example, in the Boston, Washington corridor. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, so, so to have that fierce, independent, can do jack of all trades kind of um, characterization abutted against this don't work, lazy, stupid, other brush. Yeah. I don't know how they, 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 they go together. Yeah, and that's interesting because I read, I wish I could pull it up and tell you the, who wrote this. I can maybe send it to you afterwards, but I read another article um, after I wrote mine where someone was uh, sort of talking about the how the two women in the uh, book and the movie symbolize kind of two stereotypes of that class of people, that like rural Appalachia people, um, where the mother, Amy Adams' character kind of represents like the bad hillbilly of like the person who lives on welfare and drains the system and, you know, won't, um, blames everyone but herself. And then the grandmother is like the good hillbilly of the person uh -huh. who is, you know, self-sufficient and, and, um, you know, a hard ass and, uh, is gonna call it like it is. And, um, and, you know, lights her husband on fire when he comes home <laughs> drunk again, like that kind of sort of, and I think both are both are generalizations and both come with their own set of kind of issues. Um, but I thought that was a really interesting analysis too. That so I can I can send you that article. Okay. You. I appreciate that. I appreciate mm -hmm. that. Um okay, so so I asked you what the push factors were in East Tennessee that were driving you to leave. Did you leave? Yes. I um well <laughs> that's a good question. <laughs> I definitely um I, all through high school, I really wanted to leave. And I was thinking about college as like a, a way to, to get out. Um, but I actually ended up going to Davidson, which is in North Carolina and like for a four hour drive from my home. And it's also where my whole family went um, on my mom's side. So something kind of kept me around. Um, and I did end up after college, I moved to Denver to work for this environmental nonprofit. And I came back, um, during the summer, um, pretty much when the pandemic hit, and I'm going to stick around here for a while. But I think, um, in a way, going to college and encountering people of other cultures and with their own, everyone kind of comes bringing their own stuff. And it was that moment when I encountered people with their own stuff that I was like, oh, I have my stuff and I love my stuff and I want to bring it with me too. So it was like, even though I didn't leave the region, that process was a big part of what made me appreciate where I was from. Okay. Well, if, if I know my geography right, and hopefully I do, Davidson is in the Charlotte metro area. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, Just north of Charlotte. So I, I, I'm not quite exactly sure where your hometown is, but I, if it's in the hills of Appalachia, I'm sure metro Charlotte had a very different feel. Well, Davidson is um, sort of uh, it's sort of a little, it still has a small town vibe. And so I think the, the feeling was very, um, was very similar to my hometown in, in the hills. Um, but I also studied abroad in Prague, which was my first time living in a major city. And that was wow. a huge, huge culture difference for me with, <laughs> to live in an actual city, um, especially abroad. Right, right, right. Ha, huh, so uh, were you a first time college student? First uh, no. generation college? Okay. No, my parents both went to college and grad school. Gotcha. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So the, the transition, you already had some of the vocabulary. Yeah. And in, into college. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. For sure. Uh, what pulled you back? I, I, I've lived in Denver, right? I, I, oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I lived in downtown for uh, a year mm -hmm. uh, before I eventually came back. What brought you back? 
I love Denver and I could see myself going back. Um, but I think I, there were a lot of things that I missed and I remember specifically, so my, my parents are folk musicians um, and I'm a musician and I grew up when we would like throw parties with my parents' friends, it was always, I guess what you would like traditionally call a picking night, which is, or a picket night, which is like everyone brings their instruments and everyone just kind of jams out together. So I grew up with a lot of that. When you hang out, everyone just has instruments and you just play. And, uh, and I remember when I was in Denver, I was like, where, are, like, why doesn't anybody <laughs> bring their instruments over when we all hang out? And I tried looking for sort of, uh, I was like, tried to search for picking nights or jam nights around local, and I couldn't find any. And I was, I was like, I didn't realize even that that was a regional thing. So I think there were really specific things like that. I think the music was a huge part of that because folk music and mountain music is a huge part of what I love and began was one of the first things that I really realized I appreciated about where I was from. So I think things like that, the cultural things I really missed and loved. Um, and I, you know, it's, uh, it's mountainous in Denver, uh, but they're very different types of mountains. And I yes, kind of miss are. my, my blue mountains <laughs> that are a little <laughs> smaller. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The, the scale of the mountains are very, very, very different. Yeah. Um, yep. Cause I mean, here there's nothing, there's, there's no snow cap peaks. They're all rounded right. tops. They're all forested all the way up to the summit. Mm -hmm. And and I remember the first time I drove um, I seventy through the mountains, and yeah. just, it was it was an awe inspiring feeling to have that much height. Oh my god! That yeah. Close to my car. <laughs> yeah. <totally. laughs> yeah, it's like the the Appalachians or the molars and the. The Rockies are the canines. Oh, wow. <laughs> I've never heard that before. <laughs> that analogy. You're sort of worn down and rounded, you know. <laughs> That's very cool. Huh. All right. I might have uh, stolen that from somewhere. So if I could remember, I'd give credit to someone. <laughs> uh, well, let's talk about those mountains a little bit. Um, you know, the, uh, the textbook that we use, um, you know, again, paints the, every region we talk about with a broad brush, and it, it tries to convey that the mountains are an integral part of Appalachian culture, Appalachian daily life. Mm -hmm. So how, how, how does that rugged topography influence or affect daily life or what you perceive as your culture? Well, it's harder to bike. Huh? Um, <laughs> that's number one. <laughs> um, yeah, that's a, a really interesting question. I think um, maybe it's hard even to see it when you're inside of it because it's just all that I know too. Um, but I definitely think um, the music is the first thing that I think of because we we talk about traditional mountain music, which is what my parents play and what I grew up playing. Um, and I remember having conversations with my dad, a lot of my sort of you know, ruminations on this region have always centered around having conversations with my dad um, about mountaintop removal and that being, you know, I'm an environmentalist. So that's obviously something that I think a lot about from an environmental standpoint, but from a cultural standpoint, the idea of removing mountaintops is, um, it's like someone taking the roof off of your house. Like it's just very personal. Um, and I remember, um, my dad saying, can you have mountain music if you don't have mountains? Um, and what that literal physical geographic presence, it means to a culture. Um, and if you to think, um, you know, about the Scots Irish part of it, which isn't the whole story, but um, obviously that's where my family comes from, just judging off of my hair. Um, the, they settled in this place because it physically resembled places that they were from and um, had that emotional and physical tie to those places and so a lot of the music that came over with them can are mirror um the geographical landscape even though they were technically talking about two different places mm. um so i think the music is really you know mountain music is really what i think of first um and also when i'm driving through kansas i feel like i'm gonna fly up into the atmosphere <laughs> it's very <laughs> bizarre feeling <laughs> Ah, yeah, that's right. You, you, you drove across country. 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, so, oh, so you got to experience Kansas and oh, Iowa. Yeah. Uh, uh, um, what, what, what was your first reaction to that? Well, I've heard that um, people who grew up on the plains feel claustrophobic when they go and live in the mountains. And then yeah. when you grow up in the mountains and you go to the plains, you feel like you're going to fly off of the earth. So I think that was my, I don't know if you, do you read Calvin and Hobbes? Yes. Uh, there's a, there, one of the strips where he, where gravity reverses and he like gets on the ceiling. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> I had my thoughts for like, uh, gravity is going to reverse. I'm going to fly up into the sky. Huh. Um, yeah. But it's amazing. That's its own. I don't, have you read Great Plains by Ian Fraser by any yeah. chance? Uh, no. I, I, um, oh, that's a good one. I read, uh, I read John McPhee's books, uh, mm. and um, I forget who the author was who wrote Badlands, who talked about oh, yeah. mm-hmm. uh, um, South Dakota. Yeah. Right. So uh, y- you work for um, Environment America, mm-hmm. and um, uh, what did I do with that? Uh, which is an organization that advocates for clean air, clean water, and clean energy. Um, The goals of that organization seem to stand in stark contrast with the heavy industry that wants to find the region of Appalachia, which is coal mining. Uh, Is that contrast a coincidence? (laughs) Hmm. Uh, Great question. (laughs) Uh, I, yeah, I definitely a lot of, and I work specifically, um, most closely with our clean energy team. So that clean energy part is very near to what I do and what I think a lot about. And 100% a lot of um, my motivation and background coming into the clean energy work is coming from coal country. And I was born in an old coal town in Eastern Kentucky near Hazard. and that called Whitesburg, um, and that town is, you know, ha- uh, has declined over the years. And I think just being born in that region, seeing, we talk about sustainable energy when it comes to our planet, and that is a large part of my motivator for working on clean energy. But another reason, I mean, you can also think of sustainable energy as sustainable for communities and these sort of extractive energy um, energy uh, companies and sources that require extraction from rural communities can often leave them impoverished. And um, I, there's something amazing about clean energy that it can be produced right where it's needed and it can involve communities in really exciting ways. And there are all these amazing, um, this great progress going on in the rural sector that I think is not as highlighted as much as sort of urban solar or um, sort of the national story of renewable energy. Um, but I know that in Whitesburg, my parents worked at a, a place called Apple Shop, which was um, the sort of media center um, that uh, we sort of led into my dad's work with the Rural Strategies Organization and things like that. Um, and they recently put a, I think it's the largest net metered solar array in Kentucky, if that means wow. anything to you, um, <laughs> on their roof. And Um, That to me was a cool success story of like this old coal town embracing this new sustainable form of energy and that is being replicated in lots of rural towns around the country. So I definitely try to include rural stories in my work and that's something that I think a lot about when I'm doing my my work with renewable energy. I mean the the coal industry in that region has such a it's such a complicated past um, because it's intermingled with all of these, you know, jobs and um, all of these different things that you could really get into, which is why I'm stumbling, because it's like you could go down all of these different rabbit holes. Yeah. But um, I think there's something troubling about the idea of using up our, um, what makes the region beautiful and special and culturally important that we were talking about in order to create energy for sort of and be controlled by people outside of the region is really disturbing. I've known about mountaintop removal for a long time. Um, Mm -hmm. And yet when you, you're driving through and you come over a summit and then before you is 
you can tell it was yeah. used to be a mountain and it's flat and you can see the valley next to it filled up with that stair step fill yeah mm -hmm. and you're like holy cow even yeah. even if it's been made pretty with yeah grass it's, it's yeah, like yeah. this is this doesn't belong here that's a yeah something's thing. happened here yeah mm -hmm. yeah so yeah it's very um yeah seeing photos of that are very like I have like a very uh, tangible visceral reaction to that. It's really disturbing. Huh. I imagine I'm going to move around a lot in my life and I'm a kind of a restless person um, and I'm planning to stay here for another year. And then um, I want to go to grad school and so, and try somewhere new, but I, I think I will always have a tether here. And I, I think of this in my brain as my home base. Um, so I think for that reason, not leaving would have been, out of the question for me, um, right. but I think it would have, yeah, I think it would have been totally different. I don't think I would have been able to, I think I would have learned a lot of the things that I have learned just by growing up, um, but the sort of visceral feeling um, when your world expands and you realize that there are different meccas for different people and different centers of the universe and that you have your own center of the universe, that sort of feeling is not something that you can, um, learn cerebrally like you kind of have to experience it i think that would have been very different for me yeah. well uh grant it doesn't sound like you're ashamed of appalachia anymore uh, yeah. would you say that you're proud oh yeah absolutely and i am kind of bummed that i dropped my accent i <laughs> i love i love southern accents and appalachian accents and um, that's something I keep recommending things to you, but have you listened to um, Dolly Parton's America by any sure. chance? Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's a, um, one of the episodes is specifically about kids from Appalachia, actually at University of Tennessee in Knoxville. And there was a kid in that uh, episode who was in class with me in high school um, oh. talking about what it was, all of them saying, yeah, I also dropped my accent so that I could get jobs and sound smart during interviews. And I didn't know, and none of those kids knew that that was something that was happening to kids all over Appalachia. Um, so I think that the accent thing has been a really interesting like analogy for me of coming back and not wanting to lose any more of those pieces that tie me to where I'm from. Well, uh, thank you. Those were, those were the questions I had from you. For you yeah um how do you think that went good i really don't it's really interesting to have this conversation with you i think a lot of um a lot of the times i'm just sort of talking with my dad or talking with my clean energy people in the environment space and this has just been an interesting to think about i loved your questions about place and the mountains and the physicality of you know, the geography of these different places and what that represents in culture and in your reaction to them. I think that's really interesting. And I, I want to think more about that. Awesome. Thank you so much. It's, it's just mm -hmm. been a, a, a highlight of my morning. Yeah, me too. This was really fun to chat. I don't like to, I don't get to have extended conversations about this very often. So it's a lot of fun. And I'm glad that you're doing this with your students. I think that's so cool. Yeah, yeah. I want to take your class. That's so cool. I'm alone.